This episode of Agalia Chats is brought to you by Wolvik, the only open source web browser available for XR devices like Huawei VR Glass, the Oculus and Pico families, and more. Visit wolvik.com to learn more. And if you love the whole idea, please stop by opencollective.com slash Wolvik to lend your support. Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And this week, we have a special guest, uh, Oliver Matters. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Oliver Matters. I used to work on Firefox, and I'm now doing my own thing full-time. Nice. Yeah. I kind of got to know you by writing blog posts that were examining the commit histories. And uh, I was fascinated because there were a few people who you know, show up among the companies. Do you know what I mean? Like this, so there's like, oh, mm -hmm. look, there's Red Hat, there's Agalia, there's Sony. And then there's just like a couple of individuals and you were among those. I think you had, I went and looked it up last night. You had 4.28% of all contributions to Mozilla Central in 2023. It's kind of astounding. Huh. Yeah, I remember seeing your post and I was also surprised by that number. I guess it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like a lot just doing one at a time. Yeah, but it was clearly. <laughs> it's it's really cool. Uh, clearly, you do a kind of a Herculean amount of commits and and work, and we're it would invite you in because um, not just because of that, but because with all that you know Herculean work energy that you have, we we also have been doing this series on web ecosystem health, and we have this like sub series in that called like novel browsers and engines. And so far, that's meant web browsers, but now we're going to also start adding JavaScript engines to that list. So maybe you can explain the, the state of the, the JavaScript engines and, and how you fit into that. Sure. I guess from like an industry perspective, you have the main three, uh, V8, JavaScript Core, and SpiderMonkey. Well, I think V8 is probably the most notorious being used in Chromium and Node and embedded in many things we wouldn't expect. JSC is now in um, Bun, right? Yeah, it's an uh, interesting, I guess, upcoming alternative kind of to Node. Yeah. Focusing, I guess, like on startup things, trying to push forward its own values, which is nice to see something new. So, sorry, so we have Node adopting V8 from Chromium, and then Bun is adopting JavaScript core from WebKit. Is that... Yeah. Cool. Is Spider Monkey being adopted by anybody? Um, I don't think in such a major project like this. Hmm. Okay, but it does show up in other places. Yeah, I think it's used a lot in WebAssembly, which I guess uh, we'll talk about later. I don't know anything about this stuff. I know <laughs> JavaScript. I can write a little bit of JavaScript. Sometimes I can't even write it in a not terrible way. But you are writing more than JavaScript. What are you writing? And what is it called? I can't pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm writing, a, I guess, a JS engine called Porfor, which is unique because it, it, compiles, it compiles JS ahead of time to WebAssembly rather than other engines which exist, which do just-in-time compiling or hmm. interpreting. So it's a little okay. bit like... Java and bytecode, I guess, right? Like you're you just compiling down to WebAssembly and delivering the WebAssembly because it's smaller, I guess, and faster. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like that. Well, mm -hmm. I guess I hope WebAssembly is more of a universal, in air quotes, <laughs> binary than JVM was saying. Okay, so before we go any further, Pour4, did I get that right? Yeah. P O R F F O R apparently yep. is a Welsh word. What does it mean, and and why did you pick that? Uh, it means purple. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I picked it because no other JavaScript engine is purple colored. <laughs> I, that's a perfectly good reason. That's I I actually like that reason better than if you know it had, had some convoluted backstory about the you know, <laughs> uh, action figures or something. It's like yep. <laughs> None of the others are purple. I like purple. We'll call it that, but I'll use Welsh. Cool. Um, and you said that it's an ahead of time compiler instead of a just in time compiler. Yeah. Um, wh why? Like, why did you make that choice? Uh, I guess when I first started it, it was mostly just 
for fun as like a research project. Because okay. I guess I think some people have tried before, but not really succeeded. At least when I started making it about a year ago. So I guess it's quite easy to dismiss the idea as infeasible. But I considered it and I thought it was possible. And I thought I might as well spend my, spend my free time trying it out. There have been for a really long time, like transpilers, right? Yeah. Uh, like popular ones. And some of them can create WASM, at least. But none of them start with JavaScript, right? Yeah. So that that's really interesting. Um, I'm curious because, like, I honestly, um, uh, you know, I know that WASM, like, originated back in Mozilla Labs, right? I think it was uh, Dave Herman, his team came up originally with ASM, right? It was just ASM, and it was like a limited bit of JavaScript that you can, I believe, sort of like annotate more or less. Yeah, I think when uh, in Scripton, which was trying to compile C++ to JS and stuff, yeah, that was first conceived as that ASM.js format. Mm -hmm. Because I think originally... I'm not quite sure on the full history, but I think originally it was just transpiled to JavaScript, but the performance was not amazing. <laughs> I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I remember way back in like 2014 or whatever, there were a lot of like demos and I think those were not even as them yet, but there were like, you know, there were some games and things like, but yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I, but I know that the ASM stuff came from how do you do the optimizations um, and then I think WASM came from that. We should really know this, but I know that um, Lynn Clark was also involved in that. I don't know if you'll Lynn, but she lived here in Pittsburgh with where I live. Seen her give a couple of talks here in, in my home city, which is cool. So Pour4 <laughs> is different. It is itself written in JavaScript. Yeah. So it's like JavaScriptception sort of. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's written mostly in JavaScript with a bit of TypeScript for some uh, interesting stuff, which I won't get into. <laughs> but, it's a... but yeah, so it could theoretically like self-host itself, like some compilers do, where it yeah. could run itself with itself, which would be very interesting. But I'm not that conformant yet. <laughs> yeah, I just actually was going to, mentioned the same thing about self-hosting. Um, can you, like, just for, I don't know, we have probably a diverse audience, I would imagine. Um, so can you, like, explain, like, a, a sketch of self-hosting for people who might not know? Yeah, so self-hosting, I guess more in, like, the compiled languages space is where once you've written a compiler for a new language you're making or something, where you could compile you could write that compiler in its own language and then compile with itself which is i guess kind of good for dog fooding in a way as you're trying out your own language and compiler and also it helps just like i guess inspire the language <laughs> yeah although it reminds me of a number of you know like classic myths about worms eating their own tails and that sort of thing <laughs> for sure it's a big rabbit hole <laughs> yeah and it it always kind of blows my mind. It's like, okay, you wrote the thing. The thing you wrote can make itself. And wow. Okay. Wait, mind blown. I don't understand. <laughs> how does that work? But you know, this is how we get compilers this is how we get the, all the tooling that we have is people who can figure this stuff out like you. Um, but why did you write a JavaScript compiler in JavaScript? Like what was the advantage there? Um, I guess, I guess there are two reasons. One was for that potential self-hosting benefit long-term. And I guess the other was just for fun, <laughs> because I can. And I, I guess in a way, JavaScript is probably the language I know best. And I, get, I think once you know it well, you can just kind of bend it to your will <laughs> in a way. So there's yeah. a little bit of like, why did you climb Mount Everest? Because it was there. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah. Yeah, it just I mean that sort of thing just really fascinates me that like I would understand writing for example processing, right? Like 
it's a processing interpreter that was written or in JavaScript, or at least there are versions of processing that are written in JavaScript so that you can use JavaScript to uh, interpret a different language, but you're using JavaScript to interpret JavaScript. And that, that just always fascinates me when, when people are able to do that kind of thing, like the ability to do that just completely floors me. And then the wanting to do that is also just really intriguing to me. Yeah, I guess to mention some prior work, there is, I don't know if you know, uh, Engine 262, which is a JS uh -huh. engine written in JS. Which no, is... I know about Test 262, but I didn't know about Engine 262. Where does, where does that come from? Yeah, that's from, oh, I forgot the history of it, but it's mostly designed, I think, to help with just exploring the language with like a nice to use playground. You can just easily modify the language itself. But yeah, I guess it's kind of similar to that in the regard of the both running JS, running JS, but that interprets, whereas I compile, so it is quite different internally, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to take your word for it. Um, <laughs> but I want to go back to the, I don't know, maybe maybe you feel like you answered this, but I, I don't know if I grasp it yet. You wanted to do the ahead of time compile are there advantages to doing ahead of time versus just in time? Are there any, or, you know, are there any drawbacks? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think they're definitely two different things for different uses. I think with ahead of time, I, I think it's at least potentially very good for if you have some JavaScript you already know, like well in advance, like if you're running it on a server or something, and like, you know, when change, then you can, because JITs are good, just in time compilers are good as they have a very small like startup or compile cost. Whereas most ahead of time compilers, like if you've tried ever compiling a Rust project before or something, <laughs> they can take seconds sometimes. And you wouldn't really want your browser spending seconds mm. whenever you open a website just compiling JavaScript. Once it's compiled, this leads to my to my next question though. So like you on the website, it says, and then to native. Yeah, I guess I also have a feature in the engine where once it's generated the web assembly, it can then compile that to C. Then I can pass that to Clang or something to make like real native binaries. Wow, that's incredible. It's like basically the opposite of like mscript in and stuff, right? Um, where you're taking C and yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> right. It could. Can you do the whole snake eat its tail where you like have one feed the other and have the other one feed back and see how yeah, long it goes? I until haven't tried that, but that's definitely an interesting idea. You could, yeah, you could compile it to C and then compile that back to WebAssembly and just do that just, forever. <laughs> just to see what happens. Like if it, if it's lossless. Hmm, yeah. Either, either that or that's how we get Skynet. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the ahead of time, the advantage there, if I understand you correctly, is that if you have something that you don't need to do sort of in real time, right? If you have something that you know, okay, I want to just compile this to a binary of some sort or, a, or an assembly yeah. package, and then I'm going to put it on a server. Or for that matter, you could, if it were, I suppose, small enough, you could send it to a browser um, because you've taken all of the compile time sort of asynchronously, right? You've done it before anybody actually runs the code and then it's done. Nothing ever has to be compiled again um, with that particular chunk of code. Whereas, you know, the just-in-time compilers and browsers is because they're getting chunks of JavaScript and there's, you know, interaction and the, everything needs to be done really, really quickly. Like you said, there's very little startup time, but they have to sort of compile as they go in order to not have everything grind to a halt. Um, and that... Yeah, so wh like, what do you think of as good use cases for the ahead of time compile strategy? Like, what what would you be coding that, or what could you be coding that would benefit from ahead of time? Yeah, I think with especially like server side JavaScript, okay, that has good potential to draw a sort of silly analogy, almost right? Like, um, we have this you know, static site generators, right? You can generate these static sites 
alternatively, you could build those pages on every request, and then you're doing the processing every time. The time that those threads are blocked, that that memory is used, whatever, like that, that's longer. So it, it affects its overall performance and scalability. So like, if you imagine the same thing, but with JavaScript code, especially code that would be in that same kind of situation, like um, would be, you know, trying to process things on the server or even during a build, maybe like you probably speed up builds as well. Um, yeah. Is that, do you think that that's a, a, a poor analogy or silly? No, I think it's a good analogy. Yeah. It's the kind of like server side generation. Oh yeah. I do think it is kind of similar to that. The fastest work is the stuff that you already did, right? For sure. Yeah. I, I guess kind of related to that. I have noticed that when compiling natively, at least for like smaller, simpler apps, a nice benefit is like the memory usage. Since if you run it with Node.js or Bono saying, since that's using a JIT compiler, it can use like, I want to say like up to like at least 40 megabytes at once, which isn't terrible. But like if when natively compiled, I think my tool uses like one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Okay. So for like resource constrained. Yeah. So maybe it would be good for embedded systems too. Yeah. That's definitely a good possibility. Yeah. So you run uh, test two, six, two on this engine. Yeah. Which surprised me that you got that all all working already. And like you have nice graphs and everything. Um, Yeah. How are you doing on that? Yeah, I'm currently passing uh, 35% of it, which is a nice round number. <laughs> I always wonder with these things, like, um, do you think that some of your performance is due to the fact that you only pass? Like, if you think that as you get more and more and more conformant, your gains will slow down, you know? Yeah, that's definitely a concern I have. I'm making sure to, I guess... I, I, like my main focus is conformance, but I'm trying not to just rush carelessly, I guess. Well, I'm trying to make sure, like, uh, I added classes recently, which is like a relatively isolated feature, but just ensuring whilst doing it that, like, I'm not slowing anything existing down. Mm. I was looking at the the charts on your on your website and some of the. Um, well, let's say the website is. Core four, which is tricky to, to spell if you're uh, not Welsh, I suppose. P O R F F O R dot com. And in here you say Wasm size thirty two times smaller than Javi. Oh no, Javi is a, a bytecode alliance project which compiles JS to WebAssembly, but it it doesn't compile in the same way that Pore four does. Where instead of like ahead of time compiling, it bundles, I think, QuickJS, like a JavaScript interpreter, into the WASM binary and just bundles the source code with that. Okay, so you are um, way faster than than that. Yeah. So far. Yeah, I guess that's because instead of interpreting, I'm fully compiling. So that will probably always be <laughs> much better. Especially in WebAssembly, where you're already in a kind of resource-constrained sandbox environment. Yeah, for me, this is just a level of work that is hard for me to even comprehend. How big is Test 262 anyway? I don't know what passing 35% actually means. Ooh, I think Test 262 has, I want to say, around 50,000 tests individually. Okay. But a lot of those, I wouldn't say it's very like fairly distributed, because <laughs> I think I want to say like at least probably five thousand of those is temporal, <laughs> which is interesting. Oh yeah, so I, yeah, I hear some of those are coming out soon anyway. So um... <laughs> web platform test is like that as well. Like there's you know, I don't know, a few hundred thousand tests that are just about encoding or something like that. I mean, oh, yeah. tests. So yeah, 
So it, yeah, it's not it's not evenly distributed tests. I mean, I think anybody who does testing knows that that's probably the case when you're talking about like individual tests and subtests. Or mm. well, I don't know if you still can, but you you could in the past run the test two six two in your browser, and uh, it it took a long time. <laughs> when you say long time, uh, like I never had the patience to wait for it to finish. <laughs> Okay, what's the longest you ever waited? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't want to go on the record and say how long because mm-hmm. I'm probably wrong. In all tests that you get where you have that many tests, like some of them time out and then I'm like, well, shoot, that's the one I was interested in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how long does it take to run 262 in Pour4? Uh, well, I think that's interesting because I want to say around a month ago it only took probably like five minutes. But hmm. since conformance has improved, it takes around 20 minutes now <laughs> okay because everything stops failing so fast <laughs> okay All right fair enough um but then you know i mean at a certain point i guess you you'll have to start it at night and then see in the morning how long it took or if it failed out or whatever which is yeah i mean that's what browser people do yeah i do i guess to say a related project i run test262.fyi which is kind of oh. like wpt.fyi where it shows test262 for many engines mm-hmm. and yeah I run that daily at night and it takes let's say like 6 hours for every single engine to run <laughs> that okay. <point> in parallel <laughs> wow wow today I learned about test262.fyi that's pretty cool so what that means is that the longest run like the whichever JavaScript engine takes the longest to get through all of two six two since they're running in parallel takes about six hours. Yeah, that's actually mine, <laughs> embarrassingly. Right. But that's just because oh. the way it runs, it has to like spin up Node.js every single time, which Out. is probably like half of that time. <laughs> okay, since it's fifty thousand tests or so. Right. But also, would you not expect it to? Because like, it's doing the work like up front, right? So Yeah. So you would expect it to take longer anyway because it's it's analyzing harder, right? It's looking yeah, yeah. for efficiencies, right? Yeah. I say looking for efficiencies like it's an intelligent thing. <laughs> that, you know, like it's now now that we have LLMs we need to be careful about our language, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. It's it's interesting that Rhino and Nash are on here. Rhino is the original one that was packaged in in the Java engine. Through the Java engine, you could execute JavaScript. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like a long, long time ago, I did a project that um, was like basically a server that used JavaScript, but was like hosted in Java, and the performance was very, very, very terrible. <laughs> And it takes a long time on here, but not as bad as Nashhorn, which I think is the replacement that everybody said was going to be so much better. Is it really slower? Nashhorn is slower than Rhino? Uh, I guess I, I wouldn't take how long it takes to run Test 262 as a benchmark, but I wouldn't be that surprised. It's interesting. I think that both not excellently maintain nowadays. Okay. A thing that's interesting to me is that you you compile to Wasm, right? But but Wasm is itself not like it's not like bytecode, right? Like it's like you could write Wasm, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I have for this for better or for worse, but yeah, I, it's you could write it like by hand, but I would not suggest anyone does. Wasm does have a binary format. Oh, it does have a binary. Format. Yeah, which I, most I, things use. There's also, yeah, I think you mean a WAT, WAT, which is the text-based format, which some people write in, which is used a lot for debugging and some like ecosystem tools. But for like actually shipping to browsers and stuff, people use the binary format, which compilers generate. So it is, a, it is actually a lot like write code. Yeah. Which is a different VM, basically. Yeah. So why did we invent a new VM? <laughs> What's wrong with the JVM? It's sort of like the XKCD. We have all these VMs. We need a better VM. Now you have yeah. Now you have 15 VMs. Probably more than yeah. that, but 
Anyway. Um, so, uh, Brian was telling me that you, uh, recently got some funding. Yes. I am, uh, from essentially August, I will now be working on this full time, which is very exciting. So was that a crowdfunding campaign or where did, where did that money come from? Yeah. I'm being funded by, uh, Chris Wonstroff, who is a former GitHub CEO and co-founder uh, for an uh, unannounced project. Okay. So fully funded through that. Nice. I believe you would recognize him from the uh, very short list of guys who funded Ladybird. Yep. Yeah, that's you. Yep, yep. Right. And how long is the funding for, or is it sort of open ended? Uh, it's definitely a long term thing. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. So you basically you get to this is your full time job now. Like you said, I was like. 40 hours a week or more as is too often the case for us uh, <laughs> in this industry, just concentrating on doing this. That's really interesting. How did you like get connected with Chris? Is it a, was there a, like a submission process or somebody nominated you or how does that work? Uh, he reached out to me actually as he, I, I guess since I've been, I guess kind of developing it in public in a way as that like it's been open source since day one. And I've been like tweeting about progress as like conformance increases and I finish new features. Wow. That's really cool that he's sort of got his finger on the pulse as it were, um, you know, looking around and seeing what people are working on and what could use funding. Yeah. That's, that's really neat. So what are your plans? I mean, obviously your long-term plan is to keep working on this, but sort of at a more detailed level, like what are you thinking of doing next and what, what, what's your roadmap as it were? Yeah, I think definitely the main plan for now is focusing on conformance or uh, trying to get at least most commonly used language features working. But like I only did, I only implemented classes recently this month and there are some other like wider big things which are unsupported but like potentially could be done in the future like like temporal is very cool but i probably wouldn't focus on it for now at least since yeah no that's fair no one really uses it right <laughs> uh, i mean yeah. nobody else has implemented it and also the latest word is that uh whole sections of the specification are being pulled out um yeah. the api will be much smaller so by the time you, you get around to temporal, it will probably be a lot easier to, to implement. But um, yeah, so classes, uh, does that include private classes out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, I do have private field support. Private field, sorry. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, what, like, what would you say, what would you say is the biggest thing that's sort of missing at the moment that someone would say, wait, you don't have that? How, how, how can I use this? Oh, I guess. Hmm. I think probably, uh, like, I don't have generators right now, mm. which is probably the next big thing I'll work on. Okay. Because they can be tricky <laughs> to deal with that sort of control flow. And then the other thing I'm really curious about is what was the thing you implemented that turned out to be either surprisingly easy or surprisingly harder than you thought it would be when you, when you, before you started implementing? Ooh, good question. I think probably the, because I never supported the prototype chain okay. starting off because mm -hmm. I kind of presumed like all like built-ins are sealed because at least I hope most modern JS nowadays doesn't mess with prototypes. But I did that recently for classes support and it was surprisingly like nice to implement. I like to mess with prototypes. <laughs> So it's an interesting thing that I'm I'm curious about. So so like just you know mentioned you in the same sort of breath as Ladybird, and the, I see similarities in the projects in that like you know they're like one person's passion project that is desiring to be something that is you know like a competitor. Ultimately, I'm not, I don't think it start, in either case it started out this way. In fact, we when we had uh, when we had him on the the podcast, we like I, I could I should look up exactly what he said, but I think he said basically like 
yeah, Lady Bird is never going to be your day, daily driver. Like it's not, it's gold. It's not a aim. Like we, you know, maybe we'll get like super complete enough, but like that it's not what it's trying to be, you know, and probably same with you. You're just like, yeah. I don't know. I want to see if I can do it and how far I can get. And it's just fun, you know? Um, am I right? Like that's, did you start off with ambitions to like really write something that would be in competition with like V8 and no, I think you're right. Well, I think it started on at least like, yeah, probably a few years. It will be like a research project, like first and foremost. Well, like, I, I guess I don't really like, I'm not aiming to compete with V8 or something, but I think it would be nice to have a, I guess, alternative which like focuses on different like things that does well and worse. Uh, yeah. But this is what's really like very, very interesting to me is that um, for all of these engines, right? Like that's the, the obvious thing is like, okay, what's the thing that it can do. That's like a niche that helps it survive and thrive and maybe escape that boundary eventually because, you know, it gets attention and funding and, you know, like it, it, it can grow beyond, sort of what it would otherwise and so for for a lot of them it's like looking for for some for some niche and a question that's come up a, a bunch of times like people ask me on on twitter even like well what's what's the subset like you could say how many tested passes but like you know do i need temporal maybe for a whole bunch of stuff no you know so like how many percent do you need um and what what are the things? And that that's a tricky question, right? Like because it kind of depends which things. And do you think that there is a kind of a sweet spot of the JavaScript language that it would just be for whatever reason really really nice to use what you have where you don't need anywhere close to 100% conformance. You need like I don't know what like what do you think? Where do you think there is a sweet spot? Is it like 50%, 40%, 80%? Yeah, I think my aim right now is like at least around 50%, definitely. Because there's some stuff like Hermes, which is, uh, I guess, Meta's JS engine for React Native and stuff like that, where they have around 50%. Where, because once you get to that point, you can just use Babel or something to transpile, which kind of takes the weight off it. Oh, interesting. Right. So, so like if you get, if you get like uh ES 3.1 compliant, then <laughs> there's like polyfills and transpilers pretty much from modern to all the way down. Right. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be fun, but you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, I wouldn't want to like rely on it or use it long term, but in terms of like, if someone really wanted to use for and it was blocked by like not having a proposal or like a ES 2024 feature. I think it's definitely interesting to offer an option. So you can have like a poor for plugin or something. Yeah, I guess potentially we'll see how it goes. <laughs> it, I, I just want to, I, I had to go look this up while you were, while you were talking because when we were talking about like, oh, so it is a binary, right? Mm -hmm. So in May 1992, someone sent an email to WW Talk, which is the mailing list set up to discuss the World Wide Web, right? Which was right. in its very infancy. And he said, I would like to know whether anybody has extended the World Wide Web such that it is possible to start arbitrary programs by hitting a button in a World Wide Web browser. And Tim Berners Lee replied to this and he said in 1990, the beginning of 1992, very good question. The problem is that of a programming language. You need something really powerful, but at the same time ubiquitous. Remember, a facet of the web is universal readership. There is no universal interpreted programming language, but there are some close tries, lists, shell scripts. You also need something which can run in a very safe mode to prevent virus attacks. It should be public domain. A pre-compiled standard binary form would be really cool too. Sadly, it isn't there yet. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost here, I guess. Apparently. Yeah, I think Wasm is definitely Yeah, I think Wasm is definitely very interesting. Like I don't think it will replace JavaScript or anything. 
but I think in some use cases, it's definitely like very appealing. Yeah, it was, it's a interesting. It can speed up things in the language itself, right? But it can't necessarily help with like the things that aren't in the language. So like, let's say that you have a, you know, your Angular program or whatever, right? Like you have your Angular website. Like Pour4 is not going to so much help all the stuff that's in the browser doing the, like it's not going to make your fetch go faster. It's not going to make your DOM manipulations go faster, right? Yeah, I don't, at least for now, I don't really envision people shipping like pull full binaries, like free websites. I don't think that at least like, unless it suddenly becomes very appealing, <laughs> it's not really a goal. Right. But because of the way that like some things like preact or react work where they do all the work not in the DOM tree and then sort of like build a patch set more or less. Do you think that it could improve the performance of that because they're just like pure functions? Yeah, potentially. Have you tried anything like that? I'm curious. I haven't tried anything like touching the DOM, but I have done some experiments with just like comparing the performance of like a random like Fibonacci function or something like simple benchmark, mm -hmm. but just running the JS version then running the like pull full compile version. And it is interesting to see the different like overheads. Yeah. Yeah. I know you have this playground on your, on your website. Maybe we can like mouth blog what, what we're looking at here. <laughs> it, it's like uh there's a drop down that has a number of like sample programs, like small sample programs. So sum of digits, factorial, prime numbers, Fibonacci. And then there's a second that is a drop down that has parsers. Um, and then a third with a target and the targets are WASM and C. Um, and then there's an output window on, on the right, um, at least on a desktop, I'm not sure on a mobile, but it's on the right. And what is on the right is the WASM, right? Yeah. It's like the text format, like decompiled. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, what is the deal with the parser? Yeah. So the... I guess, like, to mention, the project is primarily from scratch. Not really for any particular reason, but, like, I guess, like, to have, like, full control of everything. But the one part which isn't made by me is the parser for JavaScript. And I intentionally made it so you can choose from different ones available because they all output, like, a standard abstract syntax tree format. So, like, each one has its own pros and cons. So like uh, Babel's parser supports TypeScript, for example, and some of the like more niche upcoming TC39 proposals, but it's also quite slow. So there's other ones you can use if like, you know, you're not using that stuff and like parsing is being slow for some reason. Cool. Sure. I have really just one more question from my side. Where, like, what is your sort of your, what's your dream of where you would see Four four used, or in what ways it would be used when, like, you're done with. Mm, yeah, I guess with implementing it, being like super dreamful. Well, like existing, like CLI apps, for example, like something like Webpack, being able to theoretically just dump that into Pour four, and it just making like a relatively small, fast binary, as if it was just C or something, would be very cool. But also very far out. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's fair. But you know, yeah. if you could wave the magic wand and it's just all done, which wouldn't which wouldn't be fun. Obviously, you wouldn't learn anything from that. But you know, or if if someone if if you come back from ten years in the future after it's all done, or twenty years, or however long it's going to take you, what would you you know what would you want them to say and say things like, well, yeah, like Webpack now is tiny and really fast because. It gets run through Pour4 ahead of uh, time. I guess. Any, anything else? For some, I don't know if you've seen, uh, Amazon have been making a JS runtime called LLRT, which is focused on like the AWS okay. Lambda stuff of like, it doesn't have a just-in-time compiler and it only interprets to try and make it like start really fast. Because if it's just like a script which 
like fetches a text file and then returns it. You don't really need a just in time compiler for that, since like there's barely any actual JavaScript. Well, they like I think stuff mm-hmm. like that is very interesting since like you have one known like JavaScript file, which like you know will be like deployed to the edge or like to the cloud in quotes. So I think potentially like if you deployed by compiling it ahead of time, it should like be hopefully very fast, but also like basically no startup costs because you're not like spinning up a JIT compiler or like an entire runtime every time. Yeah, that's uh, I can I can imagine that being a really interesting niche actually. Um, like you could get perhaps sponsorship from like. Cloudflare or one of those to you know to put it in workers right and they're in their workers at the edge yeah it's a very interesting like opportunity I think yeah definitely and I, and I can see it like even the ones that are out there have limits already and they have like some custom apis which is like actually uh, another thing that I think is kind of interesting about yours I want to ask you are you do you belong to the winter CG or will you join the winter CG with this because I see that you do also have things that you support that aren't just JavaScript, right? Like you have TypeScript support. Yeah. I have actually so, done a bit of winter CG. It's like participation in my free time already. And I'm definitely interested in doing more with this. I see you also have like, uh, you know, you have sort of like the, um, some proposals that you liked that are very early stage, but you still like implemented them because you think they're cool and fun, right? Yeah, there's. I've started a, uh, I called it a CLI API proposal there, which was adopted a while ago, which is because basically every existing like server-side runtime basically just implements nodes APIs. Mm-hmm. So everyone's yeah. used to. And that's kind of a proposal to try and make an actual standard. It's like Node's yeah. API is nice, but it's not a standard. <laughs> There's yeah. zero specification. Yeah. So I have a just one last question. Like um you you have in your in your GitHub you have like some to do's and some things that you that you um support and things like that. I, I think that you support some things that uh are only proposals like math.clamp, um, a bunch of math extensions. Um, yeah. Are they behind a flag or something, or are they just like... Uh, they aren't, but I, I could do that. My thinking right now is I don't have much behind flags because like it's an unstable project, so <laughs> like I guess yeah. there isn't much use to that, but I probably will if it becomes stable in the future. Yeah, I think it is nice, I guess like owing to the fact that it's written in JavaScript, it's pretty nice to just tinker around Mm-hmm. But like some proposals might just be like five lines of JS. Right. Okay. Uh, Eric, do you have anything else? No, just thank you so much for uh, coming to talk to us, Oliver. This was really, really enlightening. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on.